Praise the Lord. We are back today with our new study, and the study for today and the coming weeks will concern the rapture, will concern the resurrection. There's a lot to learn about the rapture, the resurrection. We want you to know that at the uh, second coming of Jesus, all born again Christians will be caught up, the scripture says, caught up to meet Jesus in the air. Thessalonians talks about it in chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians. It gives uh, some detail concerning this caught up. It reads, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, after the dead in Christ rise, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these Words, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Thus, according to this scripture, at verse 16, it's the Lord himself who's going to descend from heaven. And then we're told next, he descends from heaven. Next, we're told that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then verse 17 tells us those of us who are alive after the dead in Christ rise first and those of us who are alive will then with them be caught up to the clouds uh, to meet Jesus in the air to meet the Lord in the air <clears throat> so he's going to descend from heaven he's going to stop uh, in the sky he won't con return completely to the earth and the dead will rise we who are alive will be caught up then with the dead that has arisen and we're going to verse 17 says meet the Lord in the air to ever be with the Lord however before that ascension can take place for the dead can come up out of the ground, out of the grave, the dead in Christ. <clears throat> before those who are alive, before they can ascend from the earth, a change must first take place to those bodies that we are in, that are alive and that the dead were in when they were buried. A change must first take place to those bodies of the dead and living who are about to be raptured. This change that must take place was recorded by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He says in verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So the change takes place before the ascension. What is the change? Verse 53 says this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So or after. So when this corruptible shall have put on in corruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory so a change has to take place but why must our bodies be changed and the change must take place before the ascension why the change uh, verse 50 lets us know because 
flesh and blood cannot ascend. Corrupt bodies cannot enter heaven. We must therefore be changed with bodies to accommodate a new environment since we're leaving this environment, Earth. We need a change in bodies to accommodate the new environment to which we are going. And then Paul says, and that change that must take place is going to be instantaneously. It's instantaneous. It's going to be in a moment. We will be raised in a moment, instantaneously, we will be changed, we will be raised with an incorruptible and an immortal body, and those changes must take place before the ascension. And the incorruptible body and the immortal body is necessary for us, and we'll never again, once that change takes place, be impacted by sin or by death. That's what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Since a change is going to take place, we must recognize that we will have, after that change, we will have a bloodless, non-fleshly, glorified body. And uh, that's confirmed because in verse 50 of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Now what that means then is flesh is not going up into heaven, which means when we come out of, up out of the grave, we won't have a body of flesh. And blood is not going to enter into heaven, which means that that body that we will have will be a non-fleshly body and a bloodless body because Paul said flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so when we get up out of the grave, the change is going to be sudden and we're going to be different. Our bodies are going to be different. If it's wise to call it a body, it's going to be bloodless, non-fleshly, glorified, resurrected. We will have immortal bodies which can never again be attacked by death uh, because uh, there was a study that I did do because death will still be existent. Death is, um, it was in another Bible study that was done that death is a necessary part of the physical creation of God. So death is necessary. It was that death was never meant to be a part of the body of man our death was never meant to have an impact on man, but death is a necessary good part of creation. And so we will have immortal bodies which can never again be attacked by death as Adam's body was attacked by death. Our new bodies cannot be attacked by death, which uh, will still be in existence because I said physical existence, for uh, physical existence, death is a good part of physical resistance, uh, existence because when God made everything he said everything that he made was good to even include death the bad part about death was when it invaded men's bodies but that's another study we will have immortal bodies which cannot be attacked by death we will have bodies suitable for life both on earth and life on earth is called uh, when righteousness fills the earth and sin is no more those who abide on the earth will be dwelling in what is called the kingdom of heaven. And those who will be dwelling away from this earth in heaven will be dwelling in what's called the kingdom of God. So there's a difference between the two. The kingdom of heaven is the earth when righteousness fills the earth. And the kingdom of God is where God dwells, which we call heaven. And so the bodies that we will have have to be suitable for both places, for both to live in the kingdom of heaven, if that is going to be where our, our abode is going to be, and that was another Bible study, or else to live in the kingdom of God. Because that we had the Bible study that talked about there are those of us who will be dwelling in the kingdom of heaven that is, is on the earth without, the Bible calls it, world without, world without end, where righteousness fills the earth, 
and then there will be those that will be blessed to dwell in the kingdom of God. The bodies that we will get will be bodies that would be, be necessarily suitable for both life on this earth in the kingdom of heaven and life in the heavens in the kingdom of God. Our bodies must not be dependent if we're going if we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, there's no human that can go into space without having a suit that is made uh, to protect his body from the extremes away from this earth. And likewise, if we're going to be leaving this earth and flesh and blood bodies necessarily lead, need air to breathe and many other things, if we're going to be leaving this earth, our bodies must not be dependent upon our bodies must be able to live in an environment where there is no air or atmospheric pressure. Our body must not be, these bodies we're going to get must not be dependent upon air and atmospheric pressure because we're going to ascend above the clouds. We're going to leave the earth, Earth's atmosphere. And, and uh, 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 for one who thinks that they can ascend up into the sky just five miles up into the sky, and you're going to instantly die if you are in this body. But if we're going to be leaving this earth caught up in a cloud, it's obvious that we've got to also have a different body, a body that is not dependent upon air, atmospheric pressure, and any of the other laws that affect the physical body. If we're going to ascend above the cloud, and even more, leave the earth's environment, we need a different body. That's why the change has to take place. We must not be able to be impacted where we're going, we, are, we must not be impacted by the extremes of hostile space as we journey to heaven. And then we're going to enter into, and I don't even know how to explain it, except the Bible says, I have not seen, here, have not heard. We're going to enter into an entirely different environment. It's called heaven. And we have to have bodies that is suitable for that place. Possessing then immortality, our bodies must be impervious to wearing down, to growing old. It must be able to live outside of laws such as gravity and radiation, which, have, which only have an impact on our fleshly bodies. The proof of needing and acquiring an entirely different body is found in the scriptures. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, God lets us know that uh, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, our earthly house of this tabernacle is the body that we're in right now. This is our earthly house of this. If the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, well, when you die, it's going to be dissolved in the earth. If you are alive when he returns, then it's going to be resolved by just being changed. In the earth, you go, the body's going to have to be changed. If, the, if our earthly house of this tabernacle, for those that are in the grave right now, it's talk to, we hear that being said of returning to the dust. If our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, constructed because of those who are going to be dwelling in the heavens. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we got a building, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal, to, to, to be able to exist and survive in the heavens. Now some teach that the rapture is going to be instantaneous. They, they say it's going to be, and I've said it too, Holly here and Lou here there. There are some that teach that the rapture will be instantaneous. The scriptures do not support the fact that the rapture is going to be a quick occurrence. There's no scripture that supports that view. The scriptures do not say that we will be caught up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The scripture says that we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, the change is going to take place instantaneously. The rapture is not going to take place instantaneous, and we're going to more detail in that of that in terms of how the rapture will occur, because the rapture is a slow process. Uh, the change is quick, uh, and as I said, in a future Bible study, we'll go into the into the mechanics of the actual rapture. 
So the scriptures do not say that we will be caught up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's what we, that's what we've heard, and that's what we've always been taught, and that's what certain movies purport. That's not the case. The change takes place, and that's what Paul says in First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verse fifty-two. He says, "In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible." and we shall be changed. So in a moment, we shall be changed from corruption to incorruption, from mortal to immortality. That change is not going to take place. It doesn't say that the catching away or the rapture is going to take place. In a moment, we shall be changed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 55, we're told that this bodily change from a fleshly body to our new body must occur or will occur before we are caught up, before the ascension take place. So again, there's absolutely no scripture telling us that the rapture will be instantaneous or, we will, or that the rapture will occur in the twinkling of an eye. The scriptures tell us that it is the body that will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of the eye, not the catching up taking place rapidly. That catching up is also called the rapture. And I always say, I always say catching up because the word, the term rapture is not found in the Bible. And so again, it's in a moment. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, we will be changed. Paul also informs us that there will be a bodily change from a pre-resurrection body made of flesh to a post-resurrection body, the type of which we don't presently know what that post-resurrection body is going to be constructed of. The house that we're going to dwell in in the post-resurrection body, um, the scriptures do not reveal what the makeup of that body is going to be. For example, our pre-resurrection body, not only is it flesh and blood, but it's carbon-based. That post-resurrection body is not going to be flesh, it's not going to be blood, and I don't know what it's going to be based on. So, But Paul informs us that there will be, because we shall be changed, there will be a bodily change from the body that we have now to the body that will be. Thus then, our new bodies will be totally unlike our old bodies, we know that the old bodies will be flesh and blood and carbon based. Our new bodies are going to be not be flesh. It's, there will be no blood in it. And we don't know what it's going to be based on. Uh, it's going to be a different body, a body made by God, made without hands. Our, I, I may as well so I'll say it. Our old bodies is made with hands. It's made from a man and a woman. Our new bodies are going to be made by God. Our, our new bodies will be totally unlike our old bodies, such that only those that are raptured with us will know us. You're going to see what I meant by that, what I mean by that in a moment. Since we have our new bodies, and our new bodies are different from our old bodies, only those who are raptured with us will know us. And as we're going to see, those not raptured, although they had known us before the rapture, will not know us if we were to appear to them after the rapture. If after the rapture, and we have our new bodies, we appear to those who have not yet been raptured, they wouldn't know who we are because our bodies will be different. Our new bodies will be different from our, from our old bodies. And so... Uh, those not resurrected, although they had known us before the rapture, will not know us if we were to appear to them after we've been changed. If, if, for example, one of your friends is with you when you're changed, after that change, your friend will not know you because they're still mortal and haven't been changed. And they won't know you because they're still mortal and your new body is immortal. They're still corruptible and your new body is incorruptible. So they won't, they won't know you. We're going to see that to be a fact later. Those who have not been glorified, seeing you glorified, will not know you 
Even if you were to appear to them and say, hey, this is me, they won't even know you because they have not been, they have not yet been glorified. We're going to see this in this before we finish this Bible study today. According to the scriptures, a resurrected, bloodless, sinless, incorruptible body will be both different and more powerful than our present fleshly, earthly, bloody body. And Paul confirms this when he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I call 1 Corinthians chapter 15 the resurrection chapter. So in 1 Corinthians, Paul is letting us know that, 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 that uh, our resurrected body is going to be different from our pre-resurrected body. And so Paul makes that clear when he says in verse 35, because some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? So Paul is here saying there's going to be a different body. So how are they going to be raised up? And what kind of body are they going to have when they come? When they're raised up? Paul says, thou fool. That which thou soweth is not quickened except it dies. And that which thou soweth, what you sow in the ground, that's thou soweth not that that shall be. So what you're sowing in the ground is not what's going to come up out of the ground. And whether it is wheat or whether it's some other grain, if you put whatever you put in the ground, nature shows that whatever you put in the ground will not be the same body that comes up out of the ground. So um, let me read that again. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou soweth, aren't you a farmer? That which thou soweth is not quickened except it dies. And that which thou soweth, thou soweth not that body that shall be. But bare grain, if, if you put wheat in the ground, it's going to be a different body coming out of the ground. If you put corn in the ground, it's going to be a different body coming out of it. What is the body that comes up out of the ground? God giveth every seed its own body. And the body that comes out of the ground is different from the, what goes in the ground. And God giveth every seed its own body. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him. And to every seed his own kind. Every, every seed has two different bodies. The one that goes in the ground and the one that comes out of the ground. And it's a testimony that we too will have a body that goes in the ground and we'll have a body that comes out of the ground and rightly as, as I read where God giveth it, uh, that, that God uh, is going to have a body that's not made by hand. It's God who gives the body as it pleases him and in nature every seed has its other body. Paul is telling us that the seed that a farmer plants in the ground, whether wheat or some other grain, is never the same as when it comes up out of the ground. Likewise, when we come up out of the ground, or after we are changed, our bodies will be unlike the body that was buried. What is certain is that it will not be made of flesh containing blood but will be a body as determined by God because God giveth every seed its own body and God giveth us our own body. For him it's the body that's not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Therefore, post-resurrected bodies are totally different than pre-resurrected bodies and pre-resurrected bodies cannot know post-resurrected bodies. Paul is saying in verse 37 that the evidence of this is even seen by the agricultural fact that what comes out of the ground is totally different from the seed that is planted. Again, he says, that which thou soweth, and every farmer knows this, that which thou soweth, thou soweth not the, far, the, the body that shall be, but bare grain and may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as that it please him, and every seed that exists uh, God gives to every seed its own body. Paul is telling us that we, we can see this fact in nature itself. So let's see it. Here is the body that was sold. 
that goes in the ground, Paul says, and dies. And here is the body that is risen. And the body that is risen looks nothing like the body that was sowed. Here is the body that was sowed to every seed its own body. And here is the body that is risen. And the body that is risen is unlike the seed that is the body that was sowed. Nature itself provides the evidence. Uh, Paul says in verse 44 of the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, it's sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Paul says there are two bodies. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Here is the natural body. This is wheat that's sown in the ground. It is not the same as the spiritual body that comes up out of the earth. So the body is sown a natural body and what comes up out of the earth is different than what was sown. The same is going to happen with us. And like the corn and the wheat, now just think about, I'll read it first and we'll go back and see it. So just think about this, uh, we'll use the wheat, uh, like the corn and wheat. If the seed that was planted, if the seed could see itself after it was raised from the ground in its new body, the seed will say, that's not me. The seed would never recognize itself in that new body. If the seed that was planted in the earth saw its body that came out of the earth, the seed would not recognize that body because the body is so unlike the seed. Again, with the corn. If that corn, if all, if, if all of a sudden, that corn that is now raised up out of the ground comes to the seed that was planted in the ground and say, I'm you. The seed that was planted in the ground is saying, I don't know who you are. And we're going to see that to be true in the study before we finish this study today. And that's why after the resurrection, that <laughs> after Jesus was resurrected, now you're going to find out why every time Jesus appeared to his disciples, they never knew who he was. And he had to convince them that he was the same Jesus who was crucified because they only knew Jesus in the body he had before the resurrection. And then he was appearing to them after the resurrection and since they had not yet been resurrected they did not know who he was because the pre-resurrected body cannot know the post-resurrected body and that's why after the resurrection every time Jesus appeared to his disciples they never knew who he was and he had to convince them that he was the Jesus that had walked the earth with them thus our bodies like the corn seed and the wheat seed we too are sown in dishonor, but when we rise, we're going, to we're going to be raised up in glory. We're sown in weakness, we're going to be raised up in power. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 43. We're sown in weakness, and we're going to raise up totally different. We're going to be raised up in power. Thus, the pre-resurrected body, if it met the post-resurrected body, wouldn't know the post-resurrected body uh, because the bodies are so totally different. Those who knew us in our natural bodies will not know us if they saw us in our spiritual body if they're still in their natural body. You're going to see that. Just as the pre-resurrected disciples and they walked with him for three and a half years and longer. But in his resurrection, the pre-resurrected pre disciples did not know the post-resurrected Jesus. The scriptures support that view and I'm not giving you every scripture but we're going to take a look at a couple of them. Two men on the way to Emmaus and behold two of the men Two, of, two men on their way to the Maas went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. 
And they talked together of all the things which had just happened concerning the resurrection and uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, they knew him before he was, uh, when he walked the earth with them. Jesus drew near and went with them, and their eyes were holding. They didn't know it. And he was walking with them, and they didn't know it. Let's take a look at another one. After Jesus' death, Simon Peter and the other disciples, Jesus dead, we're going fishing. He, we thought he was the Messiah, and he's not the Messiah, so we're going back fishing. Peter said, I'm going fishing. They said unto him, well, we're going too. They went forth, they entered into a ship immediately, and all night long they caught nothing. But when the morning were, was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Now you agree with me, they knew him. For three and a half years or more they knew him. He's standing on the shore, but the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. This is what perplexed uh, some historians. I've read books that said that it really wasn't Jesus because how would the disciples not know him? Well, we've just explained the reason why. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. So Jesus says unto them, now they don't know him because in his, in his uh, post-resurrection body, they never knew him. They never knew him. And that's why he always had to convince them in terms of who he was so they, they don't know him. So he says, uh, children, have you any meat? <laughs> they said, they answered, no. Well, that's not going to work because if they had given him some meat, the way he ate it would have identified who he was. So he says unto them, well, I'll give them another sign. Cast your net. He wants to, them to know who he is. Uh, there's nobody can do miracles like Jesus. So he says, cast your net on the right side of the ship. And you're going to find some fish. They therefore cast. And now they were not able to draw for the multitude of the fishes. Well, there's only one person can do things like that. And so that one of the disciples, John, said to Peter, I know who it is. It's the Lord. Not based on it visually, because they would never know it and never knew him visually after his resurrection, but because of what he did. They said, it's the Lord. When Peter heard it, that it was the Lord. He didn't visually know it was the Lord. He was told it was the Lord, and he's acting on it because everything that Jesus is now doing is based on customs and habits that only Jesus did. When Peter heard that it was the Lord, not knew it was the Lord, when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Now, mind you, all the while, they know it's the Lord by what they are seeing him say and what they see him do. Visually, they would never know it's the Lord because they are still in their corruptible bodies. So that's another example. Let's try another one. And uh, this is his mother. <laughs> and they, two angels, said unto her, Mary, woman, why are you weeping? She's at the grave of Jesus now, her son. She saith unto them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have lain him. And while she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and didn't know it was Jesus. This is mama now. She's seeing Jesus standing that's the commentator telling us that not Mary she doesn't know that it's Jesus he says to her woman why weepest thou why seekest thou she thinks it's the gardener she thinks it's a stranger she thinks it's a gardener uh, saith unto him, him sir because she she's in her pre-resurrected body Jesus is resurrected com uh, confirming everything that we've said up to this point he said, uh, 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 she supposing him to be a gardener says unto him, Sir, if you have taken his body, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where you laid him, and I'll take him away. This is mama. <laughs> and she doesn't know him. But there's nobody that could say mama like Jesus. And so Jesus had to give her well, some clues. 
as he did with the disciples, as he did with those on the way to the mails. He says, Mary, and she knew that voice. She turned, himself, turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, uh, which is to say master. Now understand what I'm saying now. All of them only knew that it was Jesus by what he did, by his actions, etc. They still don't know it's Jesus just visually because his body is different. Which confirms that we're going to... The seed of corn looking at a stalk of corn and the stalk saying, I am you. The seed of corn is saying, that can't be. That, that's not me. Maybe, maybe, the seed, maybe the seed of corn will realize that the stalk is the seed when the stalk tells the seed of corn, well, look at one of these ears. <laughs> you see the seed? <laughs> oh, okay, oh, okay, but still it doesn't look like me. The bodies are different. Let's look at this other proof. Thomas, one of the 12, Didymus, he wasn't with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. Again, they only know that it's the Lord by, by the fact that he has convinced them that, that he is the Lord. They, visually, they don't know who he is. But they say, we've seen him, we've, we've seen the Lord. He's, but but Tom, Didymus says unto them, Thomas says, says, except I see the in his hands the print of the nails and put my fingers in the print of the nails and thrust my hands into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days passed by, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the door being shut, stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Uh, they still... All of them, they still don't know Jesus. That that's Jesus uh, by observation. They've just been convinced. The previous ones have been convinced that it's Jesus by the fact that they he ate. He told them how to fish. Uh, uh, he broke bread with them, and so now they understand. But this this, ex, this experience hadn't happened with Thomas, and so Thomas then said he to Thomas, "Reach hither thy." Fingers and behold my hand, reach hither thy hand and thrust it in my side, sight, and be not faithless but believing. And then when Thomas did it, so why did Thomas know that it was Jesus? Because he took it, not by what he saw, he took his finger, like Jesus said, here's the proof that I'm Jesus. Put your hand in the prints in my hands and in my side. And Thomas. Uh, Jesus, uh, Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God, after he did that, and Jesus said to him, Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. But how did he see? Jesus told him with him standing there. He's been with him for three and a half years. He'd know it visually, but Jesus said, Put your hand print, put your finger in my hand, and put your finger in my feet. Blessed are they that don't need that kind of proof and still believe. Blessed are those that don't need that kind of proof and still believe. When Jesus returns to earth in Zechariah to convince the Jews that he's Jesus, their Messiah, Zechariah says as he descends from heaven, they're going to proclaim him to be the Messiah as he's descending. He's going to stretch out his hands. They're going to see the wounds in his hands. They're going to say... What are those? And he said, the wounds that I received in the house of my friends, then they'll know as Jesus is their Messiah, where now they don't believe Jesus is their Messiah. But the proof of it is the wounds that are in his hands. And that's what I like. That's why I like what a bishop told me a long time ago. He says, Jesus, if Jesus appears to convince those that don't believe that it's Jesus, he has to appear with nails in his hands and nails in his feet and nail prints in his side to convince them. Uh, this old man said to me, he says, but for believers, when Jesus appears, he won't appear with the wounds in his hands, in his feet or in his side because we believe by faith. We don't need the visual Evidence. When he appears to Israel, he has to appear with the nail prints. 
When he appears to the unbeliever, he has to appear with the nail prints. But if he appears to you and me, don't be looking for nail <laughs> If you know what I'm talking about. Amen. So he says to Thomas, because thou hast seen, thou hast believed, because thou, and blessed are those that don't need that evidence, uh, that have not seen and yet believe. If you had the opportunity to see yourself in your new body, you would not know you any more than that seed of corn or wheat knew itself when it saw itself in its new body the body that came up out of the soil you wouldn't know yourself any more than that seed of corn knew that that stalk was the corn the seed any more than the seed of wheat knew that uh, the, 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 the whatever you call it the stalk of wheat was the, uh, the seed even John still in his natural body on the Isle of Patmos when God would allow him to see things that would be occurring in the heavens. Still in his natural body, he's on the Isle of Patmos, he's, he's, he's being shown things to come. John saw himself in his pre-resurrected, in, in his resurrected body. John saw himself in his resurrected body and did not know that he was seeing himself and even talking to himself when God allowed him on the Isle of Patmos to see the, the heavens, New Jerusalem descending from heaven, seeing the redeemed. And John was at the site of the redemption and he looked and he saw even himself and even talked with himself and didn't know who he was talking to because he was in his pre-resurrected body seeing his resurrected self first then let's see that to be true he was writing about his experience in heaven in the book of revelations and while he's writing about the many things that you read or about that he saw in revelations uh, he is writing about his experiences he sees one who he believes to be an angel this is in uh this is, in, this is in Revelations, uh, chapter number 22. All right, it's, it's, let me go back. It's in Revelations, chapter 22. John said, and I, the things that I'm seeing and the things that I'm hearing, and when I had heard and seen what I was being showed, he said, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who were showing me these things. So he falls down at the feet of the angel. But to the contrary, who John considered to be an angel, and he fell down at the feet of this, he said, angel that was showing him these things. Who John considered to be an angel, in fact, tells John that he's not an angel. But he tells John, I'm, your, I'm a fellow servant. He was revealing to John, I am an Old Testament prophet. He's revealing to John then, because John thought it was an angel, he's, John was seeing an Old Testament prophet that had been redeemed in his future uh, post-resurrection body and John didn't know who he was thinking it was an angel and this Old Testament prophet is telling John I'm not an angel but I am an Old Testament prophet in Revelations 22 verses uh, 8 and 9 he saith unto me in verse 9 when John fell down to worship him he says don't worship me watch he doesn't say I'm an angel he says, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets. So what John was seeing, since he was seeing things that were future, since he was seeing the redeemed, since he was seeing the new heavens and the new earth, and seeing uh, 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 that victory had been realized, and he was seeing things as they are going to occur, he sees a 
prophet that had been redeemed in his glorified body he thought it to be an angel and that prophet was letting John know I am not an angel I am a fellow servant and I'm one of the prophets I'm one of those who keep the sayings of the book he's saying to worship God John had he should have he should have learned from that because he made it he made that earlier mistake where when he saw someone that he thought was an angel, he found out that it wasn't. So in this case, he sees someone that he thinks to be an angel only because, only because John was still in his pre-resurrected body and he was seeing the, that prophet in his resurrected body. And John had made that same mistake earlier when he was taken to in a vision in the heavens. He was taken to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now that's something that hasn't even occurred yet. But John, 2,000 years ago, on the Isle of Patmos, was taken to the marriage supper of the Lamb, which he records in John, uh, Revelation chapter 19. He was taken to the marriage supper of the Lamb, to the marriage of the Lamb to his bride, the church. And I want to take you to that marriage because I want you to see something. And it's recorded in Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. John writes from the Isle of Patmos in a vision after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. He's seeing a time beyond where we are today. He's seeing a time that's more than 2,000 years uh, in the future. He's seeing a time when, when the rapture has occurred and, and the saints are, are in heaven and now there is preparations being made of Jesus to be married to his bride, the church. That's where we are right now. And John says, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven at this celebratory place that's called the wedding marriage supper of the Lamb. And they were saying hallelujah, <clears throat> salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. If he's hearing the great voice of, of much people, I pray that he saw me there too. And John writes in verse 2, for true and righteous are his, they, they, these are all saying hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God, for true, for true and righteous are his judgments, for he has judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth under her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hands. And again the great multitude are saying hallelujah and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And then John saw the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fall down and worship God that sat uh, on the throne saying, Amen, Amen. John is seeing a great multitude that couldn't be numbered. He's seeing a great celebration. He is being, uh, he is, uh, being taken to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then he says a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye servants and ye that fear him, both great and small. John says, and I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude. How many wish that they, that he saw me too? And that he saw you. John said, I heard the voice of a great multitude. We're all redeemed and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thunder is saying, hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. Evidently, we must be there because we are the bride, soon to be the uh, soon to be the wife when we get to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And John says the voice is saying, "Let us be glad and rejoice, give honor for the marriage supper of the Lamb and his wife, and his wife has made herself ready." Which means we are. John is seeing us there, and John is saying to her, referring to us. The church was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen and clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So, so the redeemed prophets are there. John met one of them and thought that it was an angel. Uh, the bride is there, that is us. The great multitude is, is there at the, at, the, uh, at the marriage supper. And it says unto the bride was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, a voice was speaking and said, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. 
So not only are the prophets there, not only are, is the bride there, which means we're there as well, but also uh, the apostles are there. They're all, John is seeing, they're all in their resurrected bodies. In verse number nine, he saith unto me, the person is talking to John saying, right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. John said, as he did with that angel, that he fell down and the angel said, no, stand up, I'm a prophet. I'm one of the prophets, well, your fellow brethren. And so John said, when this voice told him, uh, 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 when, when this voice spoke and said unto him, right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and said unto him, these are the true sayings of God, John said, I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, see thou doest it not, I am thy fellow servant. The previous one said, I am thy fellow servant, one of the prophets. This one that's talking to John says, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimonies of Jesus. Those are only the 12 that had that. He says, I fell at his feet and the one that's talking to me said, don't do that. I am thy fellow servant. I'm one of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. It's one of the 12 that in their redeemed bodies one of the twelve not one of yes one of the twelve that are in their redeemed bodies he says I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimonies of testimony of Jesus worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy so John is saying all of them redeemed and don't know any of them and why doesn't he know them because he's still in the vision, but he's still in his fleshly body seeing all of this on the Isle of Patmos. On this occasion, when the speaker before whom John bowed identified himself to John, that he was not an angel, but one of thy fellow brethren, meaning he was an apostle, John nearly fainted when he came to the realization that for that a mistaken identity in chapter 22 when he thought that that angel was, was when he thought that what he saw was an angel but was corrected and was told that it's a prophet of the Old Testament now John is shocked when this supposed angel of chapter number 19 at the marriage supper of the Lamb reveals himself to be one of the brethren and John then understood that it, what was being revealed to him Seth was that it was one of John's brethren, the 12, uh, the 12 apostles. John understood then that that apostle, that that apostle speaking to him was John talking to himself. That John redeemed was speaking to him, but because he was still in his fleshly body, he could not identify that it was he himself talking to himself any more than the stalk of corn that comes out of the ground can convince the seed that went in the ground that I am really you, but I'm you in a different body. And I think that's something to shout about. And I wonder and hope that 2,000 years ago, when John tells us that he saw a number that no man could number, that he saw you there. Wouldn't have known it was you saw me there, wouldn't have known that it was me. When John tells us that a number, he saw a number that no man could number, that I, not only did he see the mistaken prophet that he thought was an angel, not only himself, but that he also saw you and me numbered in that number 2,000 years ago before we were born. Where John says in Revelations, uh, I think it's Revelation chapter number seven. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And if you could have seen that in a, if you were like John and God took you there to see that glorious moment, you might end up seeing yourself there as well but not even know, amen, that it was you. Now we're going to go further 
Uh, we're going to go further into this rapture when we get to part two because there's many other things that we want to reveal, amen, about the rapture, even more awesome than what has been shared with you, amen, to this point. So uh, let's uh, come back again and let's go further into the rapture, uh, amen, part two. Because not only is the rapture going to not be quick, but it's also going to be in three phases. And we're going to be going into that as we get into uh, the rapture part two and the rapture part three. I remember walking through an airport <clears throat> and I saw a sign that I will never forget. And that sign said, free advice is worth what it cost. And so if something is valuable, then you can determine its value by what you give. And I'm saying to one and all that as you view these presentations, these PowerPoints, these words from the Lord, and you think within yourself, this is valuable then the value of what you've received is determined by what you give. Because free advice is worth what it costs. And so I say to you, to one and all, that after hearing and seeing these presentations, if they have value to you, these PowerPoint presentations, these words from the scriptures presentation, whether it's a dime or more, Show the value of what you received by your monetary for a good cause giving. Because as um, one of Saul's, the future King Saul's servants said as they were attempting to find Saul's father's lost uh, asses and knew that there was a seer called Samuel and so Saul said, well, we'll go to Samuel and see if he know where they are. And the seer reminded Samuel, free advice is worth what it costs and we cannot go without a piece of money in our hands. So show your appreciation of what you have seen and heard in your giving by the information that is a part of this presentation at the end of each presentation. Thank you.